I'm Laura Richman. I'm counsel in Mayor Brown's capital markets practice, and I'm based in Chicago. And with me today is Christina Thomas, partner in Mayor Brown's capital market practice, uh, based in Washington and New York. So uh, with that, uh, let's get started. And uh, let's go directly to slide three. Because we're kicking off uh, today's program with earnings releases and earnings calls because as highly anticipated um, and closely followed events, uh, having many compliance considerations, that's a natural area to address from a uh, uh, corporate hygiene uh, perspective. This slide highlights key compliance issues, and I will uh, be elaborating on each of these uh, during our presentation today. Uh, but the most basic tenant that I want to emphasize uh, is that earnings releases and earnings calls must be free of material misstatements and omissions. Um, let's go to slide four. As for the uh, content, earnings releases should reflect a balance of sufficient information for analysts and investors without bogging down in too much detail. When non-GAAP financial measures or key performance indicators are used, consider whether and how they're used in other contexts and prepare carefully for the earnings call to be sure it's complementary to the release. And you may also find it helpful to see what your peers are doing. Slide five. Keep in mind that it's likely that the SEC will review earnings releases and transcripts of earnings calls. And it often refers to them when giving comments on SEC filings. Um, the SEC may also consider the company's social media presence. And so the key takeaway, it's really important that corporate communications are consistent even when they're being made on different platforms. Slide six. Investors and the SEC continue to expect companies to discuss any material impact that the COVID pandemic has had or is expected to have uh, in earnings releases and earnings calls. And that's even though there may be uncertainty uh, because it's a fluid and evolving. So companies really do need to be prepared to address challenging questions in this area on earnings calls. Slide eight, turning to non-GAAP financial measures, there are two SEC regulations providing a framework. You have item 10E of regulation SK, and that applies to non-GAAP uh, financial measures in SEC filings. And you also have reg G, which applies to all public statements that reporting companies make that contain uh, non-GAAP financial measures. So that's going to include earnings calls and investor uh, presentations, as well as SEC filings. Both regulations require reconciliation to the most comparable GAAP measure and the non-GAAP financial measure can't be given greater prominence uh, than the GAAP measure uh, receives. Uh, slide nine. Um, I want to point out the SEC staff has a series of compliance and disclosure interpretations uh, devoted to non-GAAP financial measures. Among other things, these C uh, NDIs provide guidance on what the staff considers to be misleading use of non-GAAP financial measures and what they consider to be unacceptable prominence given to non-GAAP financial measures. For example, a measure would be misleading if it excludes normal operating expenses or the adjustments are inconsistently applied either between periods or just for non-recurring charges but non-recurring gains in the same period. Slide 10, uh, prominence considerations uh, can apply to headline and bullet point captions and earnings releases and that's a point that sometimes uh, people miss. Um, so just don't omit the comparable gap uh, measure from an earnings release headline uh, that includes non-GAAP measures. And also, uh, it's particularly problematic to describe a non-GAAP 
uh, measure, for example, uh, characterizing it as record performance or exceptional, uh, unless there's a prominent characterization of the GAAP measure. And this is especially situations where the non-GAAP earnings measure might show measure, uh, non-GAAP showing a gain uh, where the GAAP shows a loss. And that'll be picked up uh, by comments for sure. Um, there's a lot of details in these CNDI, so it makes sense to review them from time to time, especially if you're using a new or modified non-GAAP financial measure, or if it's the first time you're personally reviewing a document with non-GAAP uh, financial measures. Um, you know, the staff frequently refers to these uh, CNDIs in its comments, so you want to be sure that you're applying that uh, guidance. Slide 11. For the last couple of years, non-GAAP financial measures have been the most frequent topic of staff comments uh, in their letters. So it really does make sense to pay attention to what these uh, comment letters are saying. You know, for instance, be sure to provide the reasons for using non-GAAP uh, measures and be careful about titles for non-GAAP measures. And uh, be sure the reconciliation is to the most directly comparable GAAP measure and consider whether the characterizations of adjustments you're using are appropriate. Uh, slide 12. You may get a comment asking, how, uh, asking you to explain how an adjustment is calculated and why it's appropriate. Um, and in the COVID arena, there have been comments asking for explanations of uh, the nature of a COVID-related non-GAAP uh, financial measure. Uh, 13, please. When using a COVID non-GAAP measure, make sure the purpose is to show how management and the board are analyzing the impact of COVID. You can't use the non-GAAP measure to paint a rosier view of the company. And it's also important at this point, well into the pandemic, to consider whether a prior exclusion for non-GAAP continues to be appropriate or whether items being excluded have now become routine recurring expenses in the new normal. Uh, think cleaning expenses, uh, for example. Slide 15. In a related kind of area, the SEC also provided comments on key performance indicators in the MDNA. And there's many types of metrics that can be KPIs, uh, same source sales, active uh, customers, number of account holders affected by a uh, data breach, employee turnover rates, those are some of the KPIs that the SEC specifically mentioned. According to the guidance, the SEC generally expects, and this is based on facts and circumstances, that a KPI be accompanied by a clear definition of the metric, how it's calculated, what assumptions are used, and why the metric provides useful information to investors and how management uses the metric uh, to manage or monitor the business. Uh, 16, a few key pointers to keep in mind in this area. If you're going to use KPIs in an earnings release or other presentation, you very well may need to put them in the MDNA as well. If KPIs are material to investment or voting decisions, it's important to have effective disclosure procedures specific to those KPIs in order to ensure consistency and accuracy. You know, especially if you have a KPI that's customized just for your company, there needs to be a process in place to document its calculation. Uh, you know, so if somebody else is uh, performing the calculation, they're going to do it in the same uh, consistent manner. 17. The SEC also looks at earnings transcripts and presentations, and that can lead to a KPI comment on your MDNA. So the SEC may note that the earnings call and presentation um, contains KPIs and they're not discussed in the filed report. And you may get a comment asking, why not? Uh, put them in future filings or explain to the staff why those kinds of disclosures aren't needed in the file document. And the staff's also commented when there's inconsistencies, for example, on the number of KPIs disclosed in uh, different platforms, and they may ask for additional information to provide context. Slide 19. Um, moving on to Regulation FD, um, 
you know, just as background, recognize that the purpose is to prevent selective disclosure of material non-public information. And that's so all investors get equal access to the company's material disclosures at the same time. 20, if a company plans to intentionally disclose material non-public information to certain types of people, Reg FD requires the company to simultaneously disclose that information to the public. And if selective disclosure unintentionally incurred, the public must be informed promptly. And Reg FD has some parameters for what that means. Um, and basically you need to be sure that you're using a reasonable method of broad uh, public uh, disclosure. Um, let's skip to slide. Uh, 25, um, even though there's a few more slides you can look at later on FD. Form AK generally offers a means of uh, reg FD disclosures with item 701 expressly designated for uh, the purpose of furnishing those disclosures. But also item 2.02 uh, .02, uh, is targeted specifically uh, for earnings, generally requiring disclosure of material non-public information regarding a completed quarterly or fiscal period. That's where we come in using that for earnings release. But there is also a very helpful exemption for further filings after the earnings release when you have oral statements, but only if certain conditions are met. Slide 26. So to get the benefit of the exemption of additional AK filings, for information that may come up on the earnings call, you need to satisfy all of the conditions listed on this slide. So the presentation has to be complementary to and must occur 48 hours after the earnings release 8K. And the presentation must be broadly accessible. Uh, the information, uh, financial and statistical, would be on the company's website. And the presentation had to be announced uh, in a widely disseminated press release, for example, uh, with instructions for how to access uh, the presentation and the material. But I wanna emphasize as a key takeaway, get your earnings release 8K on file with Edgar before the earnings call. Slide 27. There is a CDNI 102.01 and that provides guidance on uh, what is adequate notice under uh, Reg FD. And it indicates that several days notice would be reasonable for a regular quarterly call. And it's also helpful to describe uh, in the notice if there's gonna be transcripts or audio available following the call. Slide uh, 28, um, according to CNDI 106.02, and this goes to the timing of the filing of the earnings release, if it can't be furnished on an AK before the earnings call, then the company will have to file uh, an AK, which would be a furnished document, but it needs to contain the uh, material uh, uh, non-public information uh, that came up. Uh, so again, uh, the SEC is strict on uh, getting the benefit of the exemption for subsequent uh, uh, complementary uh, statements, you have to get the earnings release on file first. Slide 30, where we'll start talking about another corporate hygiene uh, matter, and that's taking advantage of the safe harbors for forward-looking information under the Securities Act and the Exchange Act. For uh, these uh, uh, to apply, you need to identify the information as forward-looking and have uh, meaningful cautionary language, identifying the facts that could cause results to differ, uh, differ materially. Uh, 31, whether a statement is forward-looking depends on particular facts and circumstances. So it's important to try and tailor cautionary statements to emphasize the ways in which specific statements are forward-looking. Boilerplate is not gonna get you very far in, in this. And you also can't rely on the safe harbor for something that's already happened. And the safe harbor is not gonna work if the person making the statement uh, knows it's misleading. Slide uh, 32. 
when preparing for earnings releases uh, or other SEC filings, you know, consider updating the language that you use to protect forward-looking statements, as well as risk disclosure and eliminate one size fits all disclaimers. And in the earnings release context in particular, consider whether quotes such as you know, from the uh, chief executive officer include statements that could be construed as forward-looking. And if so, consider adding qualifiers like believes or expects uh, or anticipates. Um, slide four, 34. The FD adopting release provided a model that many companies still follow for making planned disclosure of material information. So the first step is distribu distributing the press release through regular uh, channels of distribution. The second is to provide notice, and that would be by a press release and or website posting of a scheduled conference call. And third, the call should be held in an open manner, permitting investors to listen in uh, by telephonic means or webcast. So with these state steps, companies can discuss its earnings with analysts in a subsequent conference call without concern that the additional details related to the original uh, disclosure uh, would be selective disclosure requiring its, uh, uh, the separate 8K that we were talking about. Slide uh, 35. It's also very important to avoid engaging in private discussions uh, with analysts or anybody else regarding earnings guidance. And this includes affirmations of prior guidance because such uh, discussions can involve a high degree of risk. So I, I'm gonna switch areas now, but I just, before we close out on FD, wanna emphasize these safe harbors are available, they're useful. And so really it's something as a matter of corporate hygiene, you should be uh, thinking about uh, in the earnings context. So now let's go to slide 37. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on enforcement, but I do want you to be aware that the SEC's Division of Enforcement has an EPS initiative and it touts it as uh, one of its accomplishments. Its mission is to uncover accounting and disclosure violations caused by earning management practices that mask unexpectedly weak performance. The investigations under this initiative have resulted in enforcement proceedings and there have been well-publicized settlements involving both companies and executives. Um, the next two slides uh, provide uh, detail on some of the fact patterns and penalties and you could look at them when we circulate this uh, because we're going to uh, turn to the question of uh, when there is a duty to update. And of course, materiality is a uh, key to this analysis. Um, among the uh, considerations is whether or not uh, a reasonable investor is gonna consider the information uh, to be important for its investment decision. But it's also balanced against uh, there being a circumstance that would actually uh, trigger the obligation to update. So uh, let's turn to slide 43 and talk about when an update's required. The SEC reporting system is generally periodic rather than continuous. Um, for US companies, you've got your basic annual report on 10K followed by uh, three quarterly reports on 10Q. And in between you have 8Ks uh, which uh, require prompt disclosure, but only in specifically identified uh, areas or uh, otherwise if you need it for FD purposes or there's something uh, you wanna uh, specifically disclose. But except for these specified reporting requirements and disclosure obligations that arise, for example, when the company's in the market, the SEC does not disclose a specific obligation to uh, update disclosures you know, outside of uh, the periodic reporting. But there are anti-fraud provisions in the federal security laws, and they could imply an obligation to correct or revise information in certain circumstances. For example, where companies 
or its insiders are trading in securities, or when the company realizes that there's a material error in information that it previously disclosed. And then in addition to SEC disclosure requirements, companies have to consider the applicable rules of the uh, stock exchange on which they're listed uh, because they generally require companies to promptly disclose information that's material uh, to investors. Um, slide 44. It's also important to be aware that there are courts uh, that have recognized a duty to update in certain situations. And consequently, companies that have provided guidance to investors may want to consider updating that guidance or advising investors that they no longer should rely on that guidance to the extent the guidance has uh, materially uh, changed. Um, let's go to slide uh, 46. When considering the timing of disclosures, um, take into account as a best practice, the company's established patterns. That doesn't mean you can't vary them, but you uh, do want to uh, um, have a reason to do that. Also think about whether there's any bad news at the time good news is being disclosed. Um, you don't want a material omission. Other events to take into consideration might be the company's blackout period or, uh, or trading windows, or possibly uh, redemptions or repurchases of shares. All of those go into uh, the uh, timing of uh, 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 disclosures to the extent um, they're not specifically required by uh, the SEC uh, reporting obligations. So now we're gonna switch gears a little bit and uh, go to slide 48, and we're gonna talk about uh, related uh, transaction disclosures. And uh, related person transactions can get a lot of scrutiny. Um, so it's an area you want to be sure you're making, uh, uh, taking all the steps you need to get the corporate hygiene right. The SEC intentionally uses the term related person uh, in its rule as opposed to related party. And the reason for this is to emphasize that a material interest can arise even if a person is not party to the transaction. Corporate hygiene goes beyond what's necessary to disclose in SEC filings, but in the case of related person transactions, you do need to understand the disclosure requirements to understand other aspects of uh, related person transactions, such as approval requirements and uh, underlying procedures. This slide includes uh, basic disclosure requirements, uh, just as a refresher. So what item 404A uh, does is require disclosure of any transaction since the beginning of the last fiscal year or any currently proposed transaction. Uh, and the parameters are uh, that the company be a participant, that the amount involved exceeds 120,000, and any related person had or will have a direct or indirect uh, uh, material interest. And uh, there are specific disclosure requirements that include a uh, dollar amount of the transaction, but also the amount of the related person's interest in the transaction. Uh, and uh, that gets computed without regard to whether there's a profit or loss. Um, and when indebtedness is involved, there's a lot of numbers that need to get disclosed, such as the largest aggregate amount, uh, the principal outstanding, uh, the amount uh, as of the last uh, date, the amount of principal. So there's a lot of technical rules as long, in addition to a catch-all that says any other information uh, that is material to investors in light of the circumstances and, uh, for the particular transaction. And, uh, in terms of timing for related persons uh, who are directors, nominees, or executive officers in their immediate families, uh, the standards being uh, in those categories at the time of the specified period for which disclosure is required, it's a little easier for 5% shareholders because the standard is ownership at, uh, at the required level at the time of the transaction. 
And as noted on the slide, there's some carve outs and special rules uh, in effect, you know, that you could look at them as safe harbors, uh, for, particularly for limited interests, like you're just a director or, or less than 10% uh, uh, owner uh, of the other company. Um, and also for certain specified transactions, you know, for example, ones that involve competitive bids or bank depository services, uh, et cetera. But let's uh, go on to slide 49 and talk about uh, the approval process. And what item 4B of regulation SK addresses is a disclosure of uh, the approval process. It's not a mandate, but disclosure requirements themselves can be very impactful in terms of driving the creation of uh, policy uh, adoption, even when they don't specify uh, that you have to have an approval policy. So this SK requirement requires description of the material features of the review and uh, approval policies. And what happens if you have a, a weak policy or if there's a non-existing policy, you just don't have one, the company may get pushback from investors. And because ignoring a policy can be viewed as a sign of poor corporate governance, the requirement to identify situations where the policies and pre procedures were not followed would lead to very undesirable public disclosure. Slide 50, please. The New York Stock Exchange now requires the audit committee or another independent body of the board of directors to conduct a reasonable prior review and oversight of all related party transactions. And for this purpose, they expressly uh, uh, cross-reference to transactions that have to be disclosed under item 404 of Reg SK. Uh, for foreign private issuers, uh, there's a reference to item 20 F. 7B. And initially, the NYSC specified the determination of the transactions that had to be reviewed by the committee had to be made without applying the transaction value. In other words, 120,000 uh, or the materiality threshold of form uh, 20F. But that was controversial, and the NYSC did back away from that position with a subsequent amendment. But the requirement that the review be in advance. Uh, remains. So NYSC companies need to be sure that their approval process for related party transactions have been updated uh, to the extent necessary uh, to satisfy this requirement for uh, uh, prior review. Slide uh, 51. In the related uh, person area, good corporate hygiene requires companies to have procedures in place to track uh, potential related uh, person transactions, uh, both to assure that the approval policy is being followed and also to make sure that the appropriate uh, transactions are being disclosed. You know, along these lines, it's helpful for the company to maintain a list of immediate family members of their directors and officers, as well as entities uh, they may own or control, such as uh, family businesses and charitable uh, foundations. Uh, in addition to relying on self-reporting uh, by these individuals, companies uh, may want to search their payables to identify transactions uh, with the designated uh, uh, persons. Um, and uh, there also has to be a procedure in place to get the relevant information to the board or board committee uh, so that they can do the approval and be sure that time is scheduled on the meeting agenda for that purpose. Uh, training and reminders uh, given to directors and officers can facilitate the procedure. Uh, for example, uh, you might want to ask officers and directors once a year to update their list of uh, related persons. Um, and keep in mind that the uh, policy itself is not a stated static document, and it should be reviewed from time to time. Slide uh, 53, I'm just going to very uh, quickly talk about uh, governance documents needing update because they provide the backbone uh, for corporate hygiene. They range from the company's charter and bylaws to committee charters, governance guidelines, codes of conduct. Um, 54, please. Um, 
the governance documents uh, may need to evolve over time uh, to reflect changing dynamics. Uh, but the timing of these updates really does depend on the documents. In terms of regular uh, annual updates uh, as part of the corporate calendar, uh, this is more frequently going to be the case for committee charters and governance guidelines, uh, particularly ones that are mandated by stock exchange requirements, such as audit committees, compensation committees, and nomination and governance committees, uh, more so than uh, charter and bylaws. Um, codes of conduct may cover multiple areas, uh, and they may be updated at different times, depending on uh, legal developments and changes in what's viewed as acceptable practices. But it's important to think about what schedule works for the company and to make time for thoughtful reviews of these governance documents, even when you're busy. And if a document such as an independent committee charter specifies that reviews are gonna be annual or on some other basis, make sure you comply with the terms of that document because you don't wanna have adopted policies that you're not following. Uh, slide uh, 55. Um, there's a number of issues to consider when assessing whether updates are needed. Have there been changes in laws, or regulations, or listing standards? Are investors or other stakeholders pushing for changes? Do board members want to make changes uh, themselves? Uh, and what are your peer companies doing? So there's a lot to cover, but uh, uh, I want to get the program turned over uh, to Christina, so uh, that will conclude my remarks. Thanks. Thank you very much, Laura. And Melissa, if we could go to slide 56, please. So I want to start by talking about risk assessments and disclosures. Uh, you know, the risk factor section of an SEC filing, particularly in an annual or quarterly report, does not always receive much attention from the disclosure committee. So I think, you know, some companies might get comfortable just making it a habit to raise the question each quarter of, of is there anything new that we need to disclose as a risk? Without actually reviewing existing risk factors to see if they warrant deletion or revision. And if a company incorporates by reference, there may be even less incentive to closely examine previously disclosed risk factors. When taking potential liability into consideration, there may be even further reluctance to delete risk factors, even if they no longer seem material to the company. So if we can move to slide 57. Okay, so, the SEC, it seems, has been paying increased attention to risk factor disclosure. So today I wanted to go over some recent rulemaking, market trends, staff comments, enforcement focus, and guidance. Slide 58, please. So this is uh, this is not new, uh, not really. You know, everybody should have incorporated all of this into their filings already. But uh, the SEC in the last administration did amend item 105. Um, so just, just as a reminder, there's now a summary section required if your risk factors go over 15 pages. The summary has to be two pages or less, and it has to appear in the four part of the annual report or prospectus. Uh, the standard for disclosing risk factors changed from most significant to material risks. Um, the organization structure has been changed to, uh, to require relevant headings as well as subcaptions and also requiring that generic risk factors that could apply to any company go in the back. So this was all in an effort to, uh, to, to cut down on the amount of risk factors companies were disclosing that seemed to be boilerplate or generic to make them company specific and to not just sort of overload investors with risk factors that, that may not be applicable or, or even material to the company. Next slide, please. Risk factor disclosure trends listed here were precipitated by either recent macro level events affecting a large number of public companies or the SEC and SEC staff's increased attention to particular issues affecting a large number of public companies. Now, not all of these will be applicable to every company, but most companies are disclosing the risks of COVID-19 and cybersecurity to their business. In addition, staff in the SEC's Division of Corporation Finance has sent targeted comments to issuers regarding their risk factor disclosure in some of these areas. So we could turn to slide 60, please. 
Okay, so here we have an example of a comment that was sent uh, to a company with respect to their COVID-19 disclosure. So, um, you know, this is this is not new at this point, but uh, but there was a lot of focus at the outset of the pandemic on how to craft risk factor disclosures. And I think at the at the time the the pandemic really started to affect people. It was right before 10Ks were filed, and so there wasn't a lot of certainty at that point. So risk factors tended to be a little more generic. And um, and as time went on, the SEC would send comments telling people to. Uh, to provide more specific tailored risks. So the sample comment says, we note your disclosure that the extent to which your operations may be impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic will depend largely on future developments, which are highly uncertain and cannot be accurately predicted, including new information that may emerge concerning the severity of the outbreak and actions by government authorities to contain the outbreak or treat its impact. Please amend your risk factor disclosure to provide more detailed risks related to the COVID-19 pandemic tailored to your specific facts and circumstances. And it refers to SEC uh, staff guidance. So this is just a reminder uh, that this is one area where, where the situation is, is currently evolving, uh, you know, even though much has not changed in terms of, uh, of the pandemic's actual effect on, on business in terms of business operations, uh, there may be more disclosure required with respect to returning to office or to, um, to different variants that were not contemplated at the outset of the pandemic. So, um, you know, another, another reminder here, consider the impact of COVID-19 as it relates to all of your risks rather than, uh, than just putting in one risk factor um, for COVID-19. You, you may need to revise other risk factors as well. So if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to, to mention the staff's focus on climate change. Um, so this is, uh, this is from the sample SEC comment letter that was published fairly recently. Uh, the comments related to more than just risk factors, um, but I think it's important to, to highlight the one that does relate to risk factors because that is, I think, most often where uh, where companies are providing climate change disclosure. So it says, disclose the material effects of transition risks related to climate change that may affect your business, financial condition, and results of operations, such as policy and regulatory changes that could impose operational and compliance burdens, market trends that may alter business opportunities, credit risks, or technological changes. So this sample comment and the others are from the SEC, they're not exactly, but they're they're based on the SEC's guidance that was published in 2010. So it would be it would be a good practice right now to reread that guidance, uh, consider how it affects your disclosure, not only to, to risk factors, but to all of your disclosure requirements throughout the Form 10K, uh, and consider whether you need to revise or enhance your disclosure. Um, if you haven't read this guidance in a while. So uh, in addition to, to specific disclosure, make sure that your disclosure controls and procedures are effective with respect to climate change, because this is, this is an increasing focus for the commission entirely, and also for the staff in the Division of Corporation Finance. Um, if we could go to the next slide, 62. I just wanted to mention uh, enforcement task forces. That, uh, that I think are relevant in this space. So the Climate Change and ESG Task Force was set up uh, this past March. Um, and the initial focus is identifying material gaps or misstatements in issuers' disclosure of climate risks under existing rules. So again, this is, this is risk factor disclosure that's not only going to be reviewed by the staff in the Division of Corporation Finance, but the Division of Enforcement is looking as well. So, you know, to the extent that your disclosure needs to be updated, or if you don't have disclosure, consider whether whether disclosure on climate change risks needs to be included. Um, another enforcement unit I wanted to mention is the Cyber Unit. So, the Cyber Unit was established uh, by by Chairman Clayton in the last administration, and the focus was. Uh, was on targeting cyber-related misconduct, which is a, which encompasses a lot. Um, and so I wanted to actually highlight one recent enforcement matter that the Cyber Task Force brought. Um, and I'm singling, um, singling this one out because it focuses on the company's risk factor 
uh, disclosure with respect to cybersecurity. So if we could go to slide 63, please. So this is um, the Pearson matter and the, uh, the SEC's order focuses on how uh, the company learned of the cyber breach in March, 2019. And then it published a 6K that included risk factor disclosure uh, that did have cyber, a cybersecurity risk factor, but the risk factor itself was drafted in a hypothetical manner. So it, uh, it read risk of a data privacy incident or other failure to comply with data privacy regulations and standards and or a weakness in information security, including a failure to prevent or detect a malicious attack on our systems could result in a major data privacy or confidentiality breach causing damage to the customer experience and our reputational damage, a breach of regulations and financial loss. So the SEC found this statement to be misleading because the company had suffered a, a data breach. And so the SEC found that they had an obligation to update that risk factor so that the language is no longer hypothetical but reflected the recent facts. Um, so if we could go to the next slide. Uh, this leads me to uh, recent and um, and also further back SEC guidance that you know I already mentioned the 2010 guidance uh, regarding disclosure related to climate change. That's that's something you're going to want to review. Um, and I provided some uh, some bullets there on on what that covers and and what you want to be thinking about when uh, when evaluating whether you have risks related to climate change. Um, and then also the, the 2018 guidance on cybersecurity disclosures. I think that, uh, that what happened in the Pearson case is contemplated by that guidance. So it uh, not only provides a list of issues to consider when drafting cybersecurity risk factor disclosure, but it says explicitly in meeting their disclosure obligations, companies may need to disclose previous or ongoing cybersecurity incidents or other past events in order to place discussions of these risks in the appropriate context. So again, this is just, just to say this is an increasing focus uh, for the agency and something that you should be, uh, you should be aware of and uh, evaluating when providing disclosure. So with that, I'd like to turn, um, if we go to slide 65, uh, we'll discuss disclosure controls and procedures as well as internal controls over financial reporting. So next slide for disclosure controls and procedures, we're going to go over applicable rules, SEC guidance, uh, some practice tips, and then again, enforcement focus. So next slide. Um, so as I'm sure everyone in this, uh, in this virtual room is aware, uh, the Exchange Act requires a company's principal executive officer and principal financial officer to make certifications regarding the maintenance and effectiveness of disclosure controls and procedures. Um, and, and I think it's important to, to remember exactly what the rule says. It's uh, the controls and procedures have to be designed to ensure that information required to be disclosed by the company in its Exchange Act reports is one recorded process summarized and reported within the time period specified in the commission's rules and forms, and two, accumulated and communicated to the company's management as appropriate to allow timely decisions regarding required disclosure. So turning now to SEC guidance on slide 68. Uh, so, so here I quoted um, a little bit from from SEC guidance that I think is, is very helpful. Um, first in some guidance uh, that they published in, in 2020, said when KPIs and metrics are material to an investment or voting decision, the company should consider whether it has effective controls and procedures in place to process information related to the disclosure of such items to ensure consistency as well as accuracy. Um, the second is, is an older statement from 2002, but still applicable. A company's disclosure controls and procedures should not be limited to disclosure specifically required, but should also ensure timely collection and evaluation of information potentially subject to required disclosure. Information that is relevant to an assessment of the need to disclose developments and risks that pertain to the company's business and information that must be evaluated in the context of the disclosure requirement of Exchange Act Rule 12B20. So uh, information that may not be explicitly required by the SEC's rules, but is otherwise material needs to be disclosed. 
So um, we can move to slide 69. I wanted to give some, some practice tips here um, for the policy. So having a comprehensive written policy that outlines the process for reporting and considering potentially material information when drafting an exchange act report or preparing other material disclosures to shareholders. Um, you know, that's, that's very important, but even, even if the policy is drafted uh, very comprehensively to focus on the process, you wanna give consideration to substance as well. A lot of policies uh, don't include that. And I, you know, I think it's, um, it's worth consideration whether to have maybe an appendix to the policy um, that you can update you know, with, with a bit of a checklist of, of topics that you think, if they're, if they're not material, may be material that you would want to consider. Uh, and then just a reminder that disclosure controls and procedures apply to anything outside of the financial statement. So it applies to metrics, it applies to, to KPI, it applies to non-GAAP. So um, you know, it's, it's good to have a disclosure committee established and to make sure that they have clear responsibilities, clearly defined role um, to make sure that everything, that information is, is flowing smoothly. Um, and then also having a timetable from, uh, from you know, meeting and, uh, and drafting to SEC filing, that's important. It's gonna keep you on track. It's going to make sure that, uh, that you're able to get information communicated throughout, uh, throughout the company in a timely manner. So it's important to, to build out that timetable and to stick to it. And then also be prepared for situations where something might be considered material in hindsight. So by that, I mean, you know, realize that something may not seem material at the moment, but, uh, but you know, when, when, uh, when a regulator is looking at it, they're gonna have the benefit of hindsight. And so if, um, if over time, you know, enough, enough things happen where, where something does become material, know that there is that potential and, and factor that in, in your decision-making. Um, so, okay, so before I move on to the next slide, um, I think I just wanna, I just wanna mention that, uh, that you wanna keep track of the comments you've received from the SEC staff, and you wanna consider those issues with each filing. Uh, just another, another practice to bear. And, and remember that, of course, the CEO and CEO, uh, the CEO and CFO have to delegate, but they also have to satisfy themselves each quarter that uh, their disclosure controls and procedures are effective. So that means attending meetings and asking questions, being part of the materiality conversations, and just making sure that everyone is operating under the same definition of materiality. So, uh, so next, I want to talk about uh, you know the the need to be aware of SEC enforcement actions uh, to help ensure that you don't mistakenly engage in the same behavior that uh, that other defendants uh, that that they have. So that's slide seventy. Um, I'm bringing up Pearson again. That's the the one I'm, I brought up in the last section talking about. Uh, cybersecurity and the, uh, the failure to disclose a breach in the risk factor section. So, um, so that settlement also found that the company had inadequate disclosure controls and procedures. And the SEC order actually emphasized that although protecting customer data was critical to Pearson's business and the Pearson had identified the, the risk of unauthorized access to data as significant, the company failed to maintain disclosure controls and procedures designed to analyze or assess such incidents for potential disclosure in the company's filing. So this is, you know, this is something where it's pretty easy if you if you didn't disclose something you were required to disclose, it's um, it's pretty easy to, to tack on and say that the disclosure controls and procedures were not effective and that's why it was not disclosed. So just another another reminder there. So if we could turn now to internal controls over financial reporting, um, just a reminder of the rules. And, and again, and I want to highlight an enforcement action. So um, slide 72, please. So, um, so section 404A of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act requires issuers to establish and maintain internal controls over financial reporting and have their management assess the effectiveness of their ICFR, um, we'll call it for short. Uh, SOX section 404B subjects certain issuers who are not otherwise exempted to the ICFR auditor attestation requirement. So the biggest exemption uh, is, is probably the five-year exemption for emerging growth companies. 
but the SEC in the last few years amended the definitions of smaller reporting company, accelerated filer, and large accelerated filer. And as a result of those amendments, certain low revenue issuers will remain obligated, uh, among other things, to establish and maintain ICFR and have management assess the effectiveness, but they're not required to have their management's assessment of the effectiveness of ICFR attested to and reported on by an independent auditor. Uh, I want to mention also the amendments added a checkbox to the cover page of forms 10K, 20F, and 40F uh, to indicate whether ICFR auditor attestation is included in the filing. So remember to check that box if applicable. And that just leads me to another uh, sort of reminder that although um, although auditor attestation may not be required of every company, every issuer is permitted to have ICFR audited and attested to if they choose. Um, and so, you know, having that done, of course, is going to help mitigate some risk, but certain issuers do have the ability to weigh the costs and benefits in deciding whether to pay for that audit. So uh, just an awareness for, for smaller companies uh, that even though you're not required to do it, you're still able to. So with that, I wanted to turn to the next slide, uh, slide 73, and talk about uh, about a fairly recent matter that the SEC brought against a company uh, called Andever. So it was about a year ago, the SEC entered into a settlement with Andever for violating Exchange Act Section 13B2B, which requires reporting companies to devise and maintain a system of internal accounting controls. And while this is, is technically different from ICFR, the commission has stated in the past that it views the two concepts as consistent. So that's why I wanted to bring it up here. Uh, and I think, you know, at the time the Andover settlement garnered a lot of attention, it prompted a dissent from two of the SEC commissioners. Um, and I think others, um, others as well expressed a concern that the majority's application of the rule was overly broad. So it's important to, to keep in mind that even though this was not litigated, uh, you know, it is something that the that the SEC can look to um, sort of in determining how to proceed in future matters. So, um, so what happened was Andever entered into a Rule 10b-51 plan to repurchase shares um, at the same time that the CEO had plans to resume discussions of a potential merger with another company. So the SEC found that, uh, that the company was trading while in possession of material non-public information. But you know, strangely, there were no charges of insider trading brought. Um, so the SEC instead found that the company failed to devise a system of internal accounting controls sufficient to provide a reasonable insurance that stock buyback transactions were executed in accordance with management's authorization. And they specifically said that the, uh, the company had, had implemented a, an abbreviated and informal process to reach the decision that they had no MNPI at the time. Um, and so... I want to talk a little bit about the dissent that Commissioner's Person Roisman made. Um, they said many have come to think of Section 13B2B as a general internal controls provision, and some may be tempted to view it as a way to ensure that companies adopt and follow all manner of worthy practices, policies, and procedures for good corporate governance and legal or ethical compliance. They said that temptation may be heightened by the ease with which a violation of this provision can be alleged. No scienter need be found. Even good faith corporate behavior may be scrutinized with 2020 hindsight. And as others have recognized, there are no specific standards in the statute by which to evaluate the sufficiency of controls, making it a highly subjective process in which knowledgeable individuals can arrive at totally different conclusions. So despite the fact that reasonable minds can differ, it is important to remember that the members of the commission who dissented were in the majority then when they dissented and they're in the minority now. So this settlement, again, could be viewed as sort of a precedent setting uh, settlement for purposes of the SEC bringing charges against others. So I think, um, you know, just being aware of, uh, of the facts of this case and, um, and making sure that, that you have, you know, processes that are not only, uh, not only drafted in a way in your policy to, um, to be pretty sort of airtight, but also make sure that you're implementing them in accordance with that policy. Um, so if we could move on now to uh, human capital, we'll go over this pretty quickly, but you know, I think uh, it's, a good, it's a good time to just to bring this up. It is a newer disclosure requirement. This isn't the 
first reporting season for annual reports where, um, where companies will be disclosing, but we are now uh, looking back at what, at what companies disclosed last year. So the current Regulation SK disclosure requirement uh, in item 101 is principles-based and it's qualified by materiality. So, um, so even now, even though human capital is explicitly mentioned, it is not affirmatively required to be disclosed if a company determines that human capital resources are not material to the business. Um, but as we as we saw from 10K filings um, for fiscal year 2020, uh, there is a, a lot of disclosure, a lot of new disclosure from companies about their human capital resources. So I listed a couple of trends, uh, workers' health and safety, diversity and inclusion, recruitment, training, number of employees, um, there was, you know, a fair amount of variance here because nobody had any any other um, disclosure to really point to uh, to see what what their peers were disclosing or what others uh, in the market were disclosing. And so, you know, I think probably from last year we'll see the most amount of variation that we're going to see. Um, but but that said, it's I think time to start thinking about. Uh, whether to keep the same disclosure uh, as you had last year or whether any revisions are necessary. But I think it's also important to remember that, uh, that we are expecting the SEC to, to open this rulemaking back up uh, in the very near future. Um, and so, um, so the SEC has stated that they, that they plan to revisit this rule um, in the fall of 2021. So at any time we could get a rule proposal to enhance human capital disclosures. And the expectation is that these are gonna be much more prescriptive rule disclosures than what is currently required. Um, some examples of what we might expect to see are, um, are uh, required disclosure of turnover rates, part-time versus full-time employees, things of that nature. So, um, so much more bright line. And uh, so keep that in mind when drafting this year as well. You know, the rules are, are likely to change. It's not going to be this year. It's um, maybe not going to be next year, but, but start thinking about, uh, about what the SEC might be looking for in the future. And if it's not material to you right now, you're not disclosing it yet, um, think about how you're gonna start collecting that information and ensuring its accuracy. All right, so if we can move down to slide 77. Um, this is the last one. I just wanted to touch briefly on shareholder engagement um, for ESG reporting and surveys. Um, some best practices, keep track of which ESG reporting frameworks your investors and other stakeholders are requesting most often. Consider whether it makes sense to report in accordance with those frameworks. And if you do report ESG in accordance with one or more framework, um, also consider where it makes the most sense to report that information be it in your 10K, in a CSR report, on your website. Um, for proxy disclosure, um, remember that's a great opportunity to communicate with your shareholders. You have the letter to shareholders, which provides an opportunity uh, for management to, to speak directly to shareholders to address um, the effects on the company, its business, and its workforce of, of the pandemic, um, you know, people returning to work, uh, as well as other recent developments. Remember also that item 407F of Regulation SK requires an explanation of the board's process for security holders to send communications to the board of directors. And if the registrant does not have such a process, you have to state the basis for the view of the board of directors that it is appropriate not to have such a process. So it may be obvious from the drafting of the rule that, uh, that it's considered good corporate governance to have such a process in place. And some companies are, are more proactive than others um, in not just allowing shareholders to send communications, but they endeavor to meet with as many of their biggest shareholders as they can throughout the year. And engaging with large investors throughout the year is a helpful way to prevent any surprises at your annual shareholders meeting. So you can try to address concerns that investors might have that might otherwise result in an unfavorable vote if you didn't have the, the opportunity to talk to them about what you plan to do in the future. Uh, Rule 14A8, I just wanted to touch on that quickly because the amendments, um, the amendments that the SEC adopted in 2020 are going into effect for this next year. Um, I'll say the amendments have generated controversy 
and there have been efforts to repeal or modify them, uh, including uh, by the, the current uh, SEC. They have it on their agenda to revisit those rules as well, uh, but that's not likely to, uh, to, uh, to happen, uh, at least in an adopted form for some time. And so, um, so remember that there is uh, a shareholder engagement component that's been added to the rules uh, and each shareholder that, uh, that submits a proposal is, is going to have to offer to meet with the company, whether in person, um, not likely right now, or via teleconference. So that is something to, to think about if, you're, if you get proposals, how you wanna handle that. And then I know I'm over time, and I know Laura already covered it, but just wanted to remind people that, uh, that Regulation FD does apply when, uh, when you're engaging with certain investors. And so uh, regular trainings to go over your Reg FD policy are advisable and make sure that, um, that you're aware of your obligations under Reg FD. So uh, thank you for sticking with us and, uh, and have a great afternoon.